Jeff Zito, and this is another episode of Celebrity Jobber. You know, you look at these people on TV or on stage if they're a rock star on the big screen in movies. And a lot of these people did regular, ordinary things. And who knows, if they didn't get discovered, they might still be doing regular, ordinary things. These people are generally one big break away from being a celebrity. So far, we've talked to the announcer for The Price is Right, a couple musicians, radio talk show host, stand-up comedian, and now former professional athlete. Like many of you, I'm a huge football fan, but what's even better for me is our next guest used to play for my favorite football team. Former offensive guard for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Ian Beckles, joins us this week on Celebrity Jobber. Let's just start off with what's going on with the Bucks this year. <laughs> it's a good question, Jeff. Um, <laughs> what's going on is just, I just think we're not nearly as talented as we've been in the past. I mean, we could break down uh, the whole Brady fiasco and we could talk about the free agents and all the different things, but... If you look from man to man, the Bucks just aren't as good as they have been the last previous two years, and it's just it's not much deeper than that. But it doesn't look like they've changed a whole bunch, Ian. You know, I mean, I, I've read the stories, and there's the Tom Brady's personal issues, and I understand that that definitely could weigh into it. But it doesn't look like this is a brand new team. It seems like head coach Todd Bowles was the defensive coordinator, and they're just kind of moving him into the head coach role. And your offensive coordinator's the same guy. It just it looks too much the same for this to be, you know, the effect. I think it can look the same, but if you really dig down deep, we have a new we have a new head coach, we have a new center, a new right guard, a new left guard, a new tight end, which was probably forty percent of our offense. Um, we have a new uh, we have two new defensive linemen, and the feel is different. There's a lot of leadership that was lost in the off season, and a lot of the people that were replaced, we we replaced Dominican Sue with nobody. Right. I mean, he hasn't done anything yet. We replaced Gronk with nobody. So, I mean, I don't know how we could just expect to continue because Sue and Gronk were two big parts of our team last year. And Tom Brady's a year older. Mike Evans a year older. Godwin's coming off a knee surgery. So maybe this is not rocket science. Enough's enough about the Bucks. It's just, uh, you know, it hurts me as a yeah. fan. But I, I want to know about you, uh, yeah. Ian Beckles. I, I mean, you've hosted several sports radio talk shows. You're a, a small business owner. And, of course, you were, uh, you know, played guard for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and were drafted mm -hmm. in 1990 in the fifth round. My big question to you was I, I also understood that you were the second pick overall in the first round <laughs> the same year in the CFL. Was there any – were you thinking maybe to you could possibly move over to this – that would be a better opportunity for you? Maybe financially you're from Canada – so, mm -hmm. did you did you have that question in your mind when you did get drafted? Absolutely not. There's not there was not much comparison money wise. You know, I was a fifth round pick here in the NFL, and listen, I could tell that was 1990 or 89. It's a long time ago, and I was making ninety thousand dollars. I think I got a forty seven thousand dollars signing bonus. If I went to Canada, I probably would have made a third of that in Canadian money, which was the equivalent of almost no money. So, right. There, there really wasn't much, you know, there wasn't much of a decision to be made. Now, if I didn't make it in the NFL, I surely would have played in the CFL hoping to get back to the NFL, that's for sure. So how did how did it all start, Ian? You know, a young guy, you grew up in, in Canada, single mm -hmm. mother. Uh, football was always your, your thing from an early, like when did you start playing football and know that this could be your future? Well, I'd be, be, I actually played hockey first. I played hockey when I was six, uh, and I wasn't. I was a terrible hockey player. I, <laughs> I, I still am. Um, and then, listen, I walked by a football field, and a coach said, why aren't you playing football, son? And I just said, I don't know. I, I play hockey. And he gave a note to my parents, said, this kid should be playing football. And I listen, I loved football anyways. 
Uh, I just happened to be in Montreal, like, you know, went in Rome. But, I mean, I'm not built for hockey. I'm definitely built for football. And, uh, like, eventually I was going to find football. And, like, you, you don't walk around the planet built the way I am and not really fall into football. It's just kind of, a, it's kind of inevitable. So when was it that you found football? How old were you? I'm seven years old. I played football from seven all the way through in my 30s. So I got it all out. Wow. So at, uh, at the high school level, uh, you're playing football. How, how was it that you I, – I, I understand that you went to a smaller community college in Iowa. What was your recruitment like, you know, in the last few years of high school? Well, I actually, uh, I did, I went to a high school in Montreal, but I played city league football and my city league football team probably would have beat my high school team by 80 points. Wow. We were good. We were good. We had a lot of NFL players coming out of that. I think at one point we had six NFL players from my area, you know, when I was growing up. So, you know, football was a big part of, uh, of that part of Montreal. And, uh, you know, I went to junior college in Iowa, Waldorf junior college, just because you know, I didn't have great grades, and I wasn't really recruited very highly or from anybody. So I just kind of had to put in those couple of years, and then uh, I kind of got lucky and got recruited to Indiana. Somebody flunked out, and then from there I got drafted to the Buccaneers, and uh, the rest <laughs> is history. The, somebody flunked out. So do you think that – was that kind of like your big break, Ian? Do you, do you kind of sit back and, and think about what your big break was to, you know – having football becoming uh, your full-time occupation? Well, I, you know, I, I really truly believe if you're good enough to play, somebody's going to find you. And uh, the fact that I went to Indiana definitely helped, you know, on the, on the journey. But if I ended up going to Northern Iowa or a lesser school, I think I was good enough to play. I think people would have found me eventually. And, and not like I was a high recruit. I wasn't a number one draft pick you know, in the NFL, so I had to fight my way. To, to my job anyways. So if I was a free agent or a fifth or a seventh round pick, I would have fought my way into a starting position because nothing was ever given to me. And I think it was better that way anyways. And and tell me, so in 1990, you go into the, the world of the NFL. I mean, was was that, I mean, you had a great senior year at, uh, uh, at Indiana. I, I realized that uh, you were a standout that year and you were on, you know, a lot of people's radar. But what did you go to college for? I mean, obviously, when, you know, when I was a kid, I dreamed of playing for the Yankees. Well, obviously, that didn't that didn't work out for me. But yeah. I, I had a backup plan. I had a few backup plans. What uh, what was your backup plan when you were in college? Did, what was your major? Uh, I majored in business. I took a lot of accounting courses, and you know, a lot of stuff helped me later on in life. But listen, I, I, my dream was to play football. I don't know if I even expected it. I mean, it was a pipe dream. I was, a, I'm six foot one. I mean, that's short. I'm from Canada. Nobody. I mean, there's just not a lot of Canadians out there. So you know, I think I was just blowing a lot of rubbish back in the days. Say I'm going to make it in the NFL, but I was putting in the work. And, like, I, I'm not 6'7", and I'm not, you know, I'm not built like an Adonis by any means. Uh, so <laughs> I wasn't, like, that guy that kind of snuck through. I had, to, I had to earn everything. And like I said before, I think it's better off when you have to earn things and things aren't given to you. Well, what do you think you'd be doing right now if the NFL wasn't, uh, you know, part of your life, if you didn't spend 10 successful years playing professional football? Do you ever think about what it is? it is you might be doing these days? Uh, I've thought about it. I, I, don't, I don't want to waste my energy thinking about that because, you know, football pushed me through life. Football pushed me through school. If it wasn't for football, I'm not sure if I even would have went to school because my dream was to play football. Uh, and along the way, I got, and I, I got education. I learned a lot. Um, I have an entrepreneurial type of mentality. So, you know, I like to believe I'd have been an entrepreneur, but you can't exactly be an entrepreneur if you don't have any money. And I didn't, <laughs> and I didn't exactly grow up with a whole lot of money. So, uh, I you know, listen, I was a laborer before I was a football player. So, I, I have no idea. My father was a carpenter. My mother was a laborer. So, I come from workers. But it's all about work ethic and, and working hard. All the rest of it will just kind of fall into place. Yeah, and, and I would say that probably, you know, really those few things lining up, just your love of playing football, 
Uh, you said earlier that you weren't, you know, the greatest student. You weren't, you didn't have great grades. So, um, you know, the love of football, you got to have a certain GPA uh, to be able to play. And it was maybe your love of football that, you know, kept you in college to, uh, you know, uh, do bigger and better things when, when football was over with. So maybe, maybe just your love of football kept, uh, kept you motivated enough in the classroom. There's no doubt in my mind. And I always tell people, you know, find something you're passionate about and then go after it, whether that may be. And I, I don't care if it's – if you want to be a janitor, you know, figure out a way to be the best janitor. And I'm, I'm being real about that. So, you know, people go to school just to go to school, and it's, it's, it's not about that. You go to school and have the best education in the world. If you're not passionate about something, you're not going to excel. So you're going to find something that you love. And I love football, no doubt. But I also love, like – I like challenges. I like uh, creating things. I'm becoming more creative as I get older. And as I get older, more things are, are important. But when I was young, it was football, hard work, and there wasn't a whole lot else. Who do you think instilled those that work ethic in you? Was it y- your mom, your dad, your grandfather? Who who gave you those kind of those kind of values? Well, I like I, I grew I grew up. My parents, uh, my mother brought brought me up my father was around i saw him every once in a while not a whole lot both of my parents worked their asses off i mean they nobody could outwork them and they're from the west indies they didn't come from anything you know my father quit school at fourth grade to take care of his family and my mother's been was lifting old people her whole life so there wasn't a whole lot of education with his life it was a lot of hard work but like i said it's not about it's success comes from hard work and doesn't matter what you are be the best my my father was the best carpenter I've ever seen. Uh, and my mother was great at what she did. And uh, just everybody should just try to be great at what you do, and that's it. And it's not that difficult. What was your first job, Ian? You mentioned you were a laborer, but what, what exactly? You remember what your very first gig was in the working world? Well, I mean, I worked my whole life. Okay, I had this conversation with somebody the other day. Somebody asked me if I ever got an allowance. I never, my parents never one time gave me a nickel. I had to work for every dime. Everything I ever bought was from me. My first job, I had paper routes when I was young, 11 years old, in Montreal, Canada. You know, waking up at 6 o'clock in the morning in Montreal, Canada in the winter. It's a good time, you know. Um, And then as I got older, out of high school, my first real job was I was in construction. Uh, I did, my grades weren't that great. I found a construction job where I did for about five months. And I realized that, you know, school was a pleasure. And, you know, going back to school was, was a beautiful thing because getting up in the morning and, you know, wielding a sledgehammer and, uh, uh, you know, uh, electrical machines in, in Montreal in the winter is not exactly what I want to do. So yeah. you look back and school is not that damn bad. <laughs> You're right. You know, it's so funny that you say that. Uh, my son's in college right now, and he's kind of bitching about being busy and here and there. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if I could go back in time and not have any uh, responsibilities and just, like, show up and go to school and, uh, you know what I mean? I think I'd do it tomorrow, man. I would do it tomorrow. Yeah, but, yeah, that's these kids have a different mentality than we have. We don't want to get into that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What do you do for fun these days? I mean, obviously you're still involved with football because once, you know, you're in the NFL, I would imagine it never leaves you, but like, uh, outside of football, what do you do for fun? I look at your Instagram. It looks like, uh, looks like you're really into good food and, and, uh, trying new things. And absolutely. I'm not scared of much. I like to enjoy myself. Uh, I definitely, I wouldn't call myself a chef, although I don't know many people that could cook better than I can. I'm not trying to brag, but, you know, I could throw it out a little bit. Um, you know, I, I own a, a, a kava and a tea bar over here and uh, on the West Shore. It's called Dignitary Tea and Kava House. Uh, so I'm here the majority of the time doing business. Uh, at our kava bar, we have a print shop. We have a cannabis doctor in our building. We have a consumption lounge. And we just we just try to make the most out of our building and uh, and hustle. That's what we do. We, we we're always hustling. That's you know that's uh, that's funny. You, you were talking earlier about um, you know you, you don't know what you would be doing if football wasn't uh, your occupation, but probably be an entrepreneur. And it seems like you have a an entrepreneurial 
mindset as uh, you're you're just telling me all the the things that you're you're involved with. Uh, so sure. pro- probably pro- this this might have been what you were meant to do. You know, even if football wasn't uh, you know in your life. Well, I mean, we could say that, but I'm doing this because I've made a lot of money in football, and then I was in radio, and you know, I'm benefiting from all of that. What happened if I didn't play football? I might have been a laborer. I don't know, but. Uh, I'd like to think I would be. I would have been. A, I would have been successful. We'll never know, but I just. I just don't have the mentality to uh, to just concede. You know what I mean? I just. I don't like to be average. I really don't. What do you miss most about the NFL? That's easy. First, the money. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and and second is game day, and game days are beautiful. They're getting introduced. The feel of it, all that kind of stuff can't be replaced. Uh, the money can't be replaced either. Uh, but all the other stuff, the practice and all, you can have all that. Right. Like, I, don't want, I don't want none of that. None of that sounds appealing. I like. I, I would like to make the money again and get introduced and come out of the public tunnel and let everybody cheer for me. But then I'm on the sideline. I don't want to hit anybody. I don't want the rest of the rest of it. <laughs> you, ever, you ever think about getting back into the NFL at some capacity? Nope. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, once you get out playing the next couple, three years, you really you yearn to get back out there. And it gets to a point where it starts to look silly. And I'm at that point now. And as far as coaching, and I like to the other day, I went out and helped Mike, Michael Clayton out with his kids at Plant City High School. I like to give my time back to some kids. But as far as spending time all day with a bunch of grown men in a building all day long and all night long. That doesn't sound very appealing to me. My life's too short for that. It it seems like uh, there's some people, and I'm not going to say Tom Brady, but it seems like there's some people, and I would imagine I would be the same way, and maybe you are the same way. I don't know. It sounds like when it gets towards the end, uh, you know, because, look, Father Time's undefeated, man. You know, it's it's just inevitable that everybody's got to – you know, stop doing what they're doing when it comes to professional sports and physical activity. I I just can't maintain the same type of, you know, regimen over the years. But um, it seems like it's a very difficult thing uh, for people to retire from the NFL, whether, uh, you know, and I I don't understand. I don't know what that's like. Did you have any problem with that? I mean, you had a great 10 year career, but when it was coming time, what was going through your mind, and did you have a, a time, a, a tough time saying goodbye? Yes, definitely. I mean, you never just – well, nobody gets to retire the way they want, unfortunately. And, listen, my, my last year in Philadelphia, I played every snap. I mean, I played every snap of the whole season. Had a great year, but I was also getting old and getting beat up. I couldn't practice anymore. I just knew how to play the game. But I, I wasn't able to go through training camps anymore and be practicing. I could just play and that's it. But once the game is taken away from you, there's just nothing in your world, your regular world, that could fill that void. I mean, you could go work out as much as you want. You could teach classes and do all anything you want to do. But you're not going to have the energy of a football locker room and, and the NFL and that, that type of competition and that kind of uh, uh, that heart rate. I mean, your heart rate. It's hard to explain, explain how, heart, how your heart rate is, like in New Orleans on the goal line when you can't hear, and like all those kind of stuff like that I miss. But the pain and the agony stuff, you can have all that. You know, it, it, seems, it seems like people don't realize that when you're a professional athlete, especially in football, it's like your whole world. Yeah, you get the time off, the off season, but, I mean, every minute of every day is consumed with – working out and meetings and practice and travel and games. And there's a very, very small amount of personal time that you get during the season. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of athletes probably have a a hard time with it because their whole world seems like it's ending. Like all of that stuff you don't have to do anymore. And it almost seems like there's boredom is going to set in like, oh, Shit! What am I? What am I going to do now that I don't have a meeting early? I don't have two a days. I don't have this. I don't have that. Is that true to some extent? At first, it is. Um, but then again, 
I put enough things in my life to where it's going to keep me busy. I think the guys that go crazy are the ones that wake up in the morning and don't have a purpose. And I just, I can't do that. I have to wake up in the morning and I have to have a purpose. Uh, I have to be driven. Um, and and I, as you go along, I'm always trying to create and do more things. And if I ever catch myself being bored, which is not very often, I just create more stuff. And uh, I'm to a point, I'm, I'm very rarely bored. You know, I have, I have people that work for me. I have projects. I have more projects going on that I know what to do with. There's construction going on in my building all the time. So uh, I like to keep busy. I, 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 that's very important. That you, I think keeping busy keeps you young. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the more that it, and it helps your brain stay a little bit, uh, yep. uh, a little bit focused. Who's some of the, the, the best? Uh, do you still keep in contact with those guys from the Bucks you played with for six years? Is there any lifelong friends you made? Anybody that uh, I would know uh, from the NFL that you consider a dear friend that you still keep in contact with? Sure. I just did my, I do an In the Trenches podcast, and I just finished interviewing Warren Sapp for about 45 minutes. So I still keep in touch with Warren. Uh, he's, he's, he's here and there and everywhere, but you know I see when he comes in town. Tony Mayberry still good friends with my, uh, with myself. Uh, Ty J Armstrong and I, uh, Mark Royals is an old name I see every once in a while. Yeah. And every once in a while I get a chance to see Michael Clayton and some of those guys. But uh, everybody has their own lives. They're doing they're doing their own thing, and we're all grown men now. You know. Sure. How about uh, telling me what it was like to be under Bill Parcells as uh, your head coach? Uh, he seems like you know I've I've heard words. That people use to describe him as, you know, a little bit of a ball buster. He's yeah. he's intense. He demands excellence. What was your relationship and uh, experience like when Bill Parcells was your head coach? Well, I was with the Jets briefly uh, at the at the end of my Philadelphia year, and that's the year I played every snap. The next year, the Jets brought me in in training camp, and I got banged up a little bit and. I, I ended up getting released because I got an injury settlement. So I was really only in the locker room with Bill Parcells for about a month. Um, I've never been around somebody so wise. Um, he's probably the best motivator I've ever seen. Uh, he, uh, he knows the game of football more than anybody I've ever been around. I mean, he knows what every offensive lineman is doing, every special teams player. He knows every progression for every quarterback. And he just knows the game of football. But he's an asshole, okay? He's an asshole. <laughs> and he'll tell you he's an asshole, and he acts like an asshole, and that's the way he, that's the way he leads. Like, Tony Dungy kind of leads with a respect thing, and, and, and Bill Parcells kind of leads with a fear thing. Right. And uh, they, they both work in their own crazy way. Wow. Yeah, he, you know, at least he owns being an asshole. You know, there's a yeah. lot of people out there that just don't realize they are one. But yeah, I guess when you when you own it, uh, that's, that's different. It. That's it. <laughs> what uh, what type of podcasts? Uh, you have multiple podcasts right now, Ian. Correct? I do. Uh, I've done a in the trenches podcast for a while, and that's just talking about the Bucks, a little bit of football, but mostly our Buccaneers. So I also have a Plant Power podcast, which is uh, talks about cannabis. I'm very I'm an advocate for cannabis, um, and I'm also I have a kava and a kratom bar. So I stopped drinking alcohol last year. Uh, so it's been about a year and a half where I've stopped drinking alcohol. I feel better about myself, and uh, you know it's just every it's to each his own. And to me, you know, uh, eliminating alcohol from my life improved my life. Really? So so I'm all about plants and plants over pills. You know, people been shoving pills in athletes' faces their whole forever. And it should have been planned. And I think people are realizing that now. It's a little bit late, but they're realizing it. Uh, Ian Beckles, uh, you can find him everywhere. He's He is. He's got an incredible social presence. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, you name it. Uh, Ian Beckles, uh, at Ian Beckles on Twitter. Uh, TikTok, at Ian Beckles Show. Um Man, you're a real interesting guy, and I know we only met a few times, um, and uh, you've been just uh, incredibly uh, friendly and approachable, and um, you know, and me with being, um, you know, being in radio for a lot of years, of meeting mm -hmm. rock stars, meeting a lot of people, I, that doesn't really excite me. Sports excites me. The Yankees and the Bucks excite me. And if I can ever talk to somebody on one of those two teams, I mm -hmm. get. 
you know, it, it transports me back to when I was a young kid. I get awkward. I get soft spoken. And, um, you know, a couple of the times that we were able to interact, um, you were uh, just a very, very cool dude. And uh, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you you doing this for me. And because, you know, we're all all of us regular people, Ian. Yeah. We're just one big break away. You know, I yeah. mean, one big break away from being somebody famous or somebody that, uh, you know, th- it, that's all it takes. So I was just well, wondering if it wasn't for your big break, what would have happened to Ian Beckles? Well, I tell you, it's one of those things where I'm. We all do the same thing, okay? So we all, we should all be helping each other out. And I interview a lot of people as well. And I, I'm very blessed to interview some amazing names, uh, some of which I never thought I would meet or get a chance to talk to. And some of them are just the best, you know, salt of the earth people. And some of them ain't worth a darn, okay? Yeah. And some of them I wouldn't I wouldn't urinate on if they were on fire. Yeah. Okay. So. Who would I be if I was that person? Right. My mother, my mother would be turning over in her grave because she always taught me to be a nice person, and that's not hard to do. It's not hard to be nice, and it's not hard to treat people the way you want to be treated. Life's way too short for that. And uh, listen, I've been in this community since 1990. I love the community. I think the community loves me, and I ain't going anywhere. So uh, God bless Tampa Bay. Hey, uh, what, what's one? Can you give me one of the one of the names that you wouldn't pee on? Who is a real dick? Oh boy, that's a. T- <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can give you a musical name. Look up Carl Thomas. Okay. Carl Thomas is a guy that I played one of my events once. He was so high and belligerent, and just I wanted to kick him in the groin. And okay. I just didn't like didn't like the guy, but I, I don't want to bring up too many uh, local names. I don't get myself. In I trouble. under I understand because <laughs> it's just it's and it's a bummer. Like when you're a big fan and they end up being a real clunker of an Correct. interview or a person. You know, it just it just like you know it makes you be like ah oh, well it's, I don't I'm not a fan of this band anymore. I'm not a fan what? of this person anymore. And it's like oh that's that's too bad. That's that's but you uh, know Jeff you know you know. A lot of times, the perception of somebody is the opposite of when you meet them. Yeah, and the the media is a really funky place to where when you put a microphone in somebody's face, they could be anything they want, and a lot of times they're not that. And when you meet people in person, a lot of people you think they're the worst people end up being the realest people. Right. And I just hope everybody knows that. You're right. You know, it's it's a weird world, and I'm sure that uh, some people. Uh, that are all you know in the public eye. Uh, it's not an easy thing to live with, and you know I nope. can understand that. But I I definitely like it when they're when they're all like you, Ian. So uh, thanks so much for taking the time and uh, and speaking with me. Anytime, brother. All good. You know, if you think about professional athletes, a lot of these guys, their first job was being a professional athlete. You know, not so much the NFL, you have to go to college and then you're eligible for the draft after your second or third year. But in baseball, you know, kids at a high school can get drafted. So we're talking 18 and sometimes 17 years old. That could be their first job playing professional sports. And if that was the case... I would imagine it could be a a fairly tough road ahead for a lot of these guys. Think about if your first job was, you know, making millions of dollars and then that ended. And uh, then you had to go into the real world and make a fraction of that. I mean, that would be a that would be a difficult thing to handle on the mental side of things as well. So Ian Beckles, not a great student, as he says. But it was the love of football that made him do well enough. You know, you have to maintain a certain grade point average in high school and in college to play sports. So you'll figure out a way to pass that geometry class just to get on the field. And maybe it was college that shaped Ian Beckles to want to be an entrepreneur. You're definitely not thinking about what you want to do as an occupation When you're young, when you're in grammar school or in middle school, my father tells a famous story on when he was in the eighth grade. He wanted to be an architect or a musician, an accordion player, where he goes into my grandmother's room and says, I've got to do a school project and 
figure out what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. What's my occupation going to be? She says, well, what are your choices? And he says, well, I either want to be an architect or I want to be a professional accordion player. So my grandmother says, well, let me hear what you got on the accordion. And after about 10 or 15 seconds of what I imagine was some subpar accordion play, my grandmother said, Junior, I think you should be an architect. I don't know about you, but I definitely didn't figure out what I wanted to do when I was in the eighth grade. But in sports, as Ian Beckles said, he was seven years old. He started playing football, or as he said, football found him. It was the love for the game that got him to do well enough in the classroom, which ultimately got him into Indiana on a football scholarship because one guy flunked out, as he said. You think that was Ian Beckles' big break? I mean, what if that one kid didn't flunk out of Indiana and open up a spot for Ian, who ended up having a great 10-year run in the NFL? Ian Beckles' first job, just like myself and comedian Stephen Wright, was a paper route. And then from there, Ian worked in construction. So who knows? He's got that guy that flunked out of Indiana to thank, or else he would have been doing construction. Which, by the way, great job. High-paying job. But hard work, man. So anyway, the story of Ian Beckles, former professional football player in the NFL with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Philadelphia Eagles, New York Jets, Denver Broncos, Put in a lot of hard work, but basically one big break away from working in construction, from being a regular, ordinary, everyday jobber. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Jeff Zito. Please don't forget to rate and review this on Apple Podcasts. I would appreciate it. And tune in next week for another edition of Celebrity Jobber. We'll see you then.